A real crime. In a series of podcasts, I want you to travel down some lonely roads with me. These are the roads I traveled with families who never got to say goodbye to loved ones. These family members were fated to live the rest of their lives waiting and wondering. I wrote these stories when I worked as a reporter for the Charleston Gazette. Thanks again for sharing your time with me in this new episode of A Real Crime. Today, I want to talk about another unsolved murder, but I also want to talk about a phenomenon I observed over the years as I covered these cases as a newspaper reporter. I call this phenomenon the ripple effect. The murder or disappearance is so devastating that it's like a rock creating ripples in the pond of life. Each ripple from this violence will touch another family member or friend and create its own devastating ripple. In today's case, Everything starts with the disappearance of a young woman whose name is Sue Roop. Her mother told me that her daughter's disappearance was the first step in her family's destruction. I have seen this unquenchable grieving cause deaths in immediate family members in many other cases, but in Sue Roop's case, her disappearance set in motion murders, sexual assaults, and too many questions to be answered in one episode. Episode 9, Sue Roop. Two days before Valentine's Day, 1979, Sue Roop wrote a note to her three children, telling them to go to the neighbor's house if she was not there by the time they got home from school. She took no clothing and left her purse with money in it. Her mother, Dalma McMillian, told me Sue would never leave her children. Her mother contacted police on Valentine's Day to report her missing. Decades later, she has never been found. McMillian said she believed that her husband's death soon after their daughter's disappearance was a direct ripple. McMillian lost her mother-in-law, father-in-law, and her own mother soon after her daughter's disappearance. Sue's sister, Sandra, who already knew she was dying from leukemia, spent all of her time looking for her sister and recording every piece of evidence she could find. Even though she was not well, Sandra climbed mountains and walked along the river looking for her sister. After Sandra died, she left a notebook full of information she jotted down about the search for her sister. The McMillan family consulted a psychic. They offered a monetary reward. They even got a court order to dig up a grave. They heard rumors that Sue had been buried with another body. But Sue's brother took some extra steps. He and some friends believed that a young man, Billy Ball, knew where Sue could be found. Her brother, Eugene F. McMillian Jr., was a Golly Bridge police officer at the time. In his handwritten statement to police, McMillian said he stopped at his house to get his shotgun before he and two other men took Ball out on a lonely and isolated road. Cane Branch Road is located off Golly Mountain. The men were drinking several beers before McMillian asked Ball about McMillian's missing sister. Ball said he knew nothing. Then McMillian wrote in his statement, I fired my revolver up in the air to scare him. Ball blurted out that he believed Sue was buried on an old strip mine road in Boonesboro. The famous Daniel Boone explored the still unincorporated area near the Canal River that is named for him. McMillian said he did not realize Linkus had managed to get his shotgun. Linkus fatally shot Ball in the chest. Before he went for help, McMillian threw his shotgun in the river. When this case eventually came to trial, the prosecutor called McMillian's friend Jimmy Linkus a mad dog killer. After Ball's body arrived at the state medical examiner, staff found that Ball had a dime and two pennies in his pocket. But the men who took Ball out on Cane Branch Road thought the exercise could yield profitable information. Linkus was convicted of Ball's murder and would eventually die in Mount Olive Correctional Complex. As the crow flies, this prison is only a few miles from where Linkus shot Ball. This was not the first killing for Linkus. On March the 12th, 1979, he killed Raymond Lee Pugh. After Linkus entered a guilty plea to involuntary manslaughter for Pugh's death, 
he served a year in the Fayette County Jail. Ball's sister remembered her baby brother fondly. She married into the Roop family. Elizabeth Ellen Roop told me that before Sue disappeared, the families were close. We all grew up together, she said. I would love for them to find Sue. There are so many cracks that need to be filled in, she said. She also told me her brother was an undersized baby. I just wanted to protect him, she said, from the first moment she saw him. He did not deserve what he got, she told me. When his case came to trial, McMillian was found not guilty. Sue's mother told me it's been a long road, but I still look for my baby. She died, still not knowing what happened to Sue. By the time she died, August the 13th, 2013, Mrs. McMillian had married again. I attended her funeral in Glen Ferris. I had great respect for her and wanted to be with the family as they said goodbye to her. Everyone in the congregation talked about her strong faith. Police officers and prosecutors frequently referred to Sue's husband, Raymond Roop, as the prime suspect in her disappearance. Raymond Roop resented this finger pointing and sent me a handwritten letter complaining about it. In the letter dated March the 27th, 1998, Roop wrote to me, I will break my silence and tell you the truth. I will tell you the truth about Sue Roop's disappearance. He wrote this letter from the Central Regional Jail in Sutton, where he was serving time on charges unrelated to Sue's disappearance. Roop invited me to come to the jail and listen to him, but we never had this conversation. Dave Belcher, a former West Virginia State Trooper, said he believes Sue was taken out of the home on pretext. Every time we got a lead, we followed up on it as best we could. Sue's three children have struggled with a variety of problems. Former Fayette County Prosecutor Paul Blake said Roop was a strong suspect because of an ongoing domestic dispute. But Blake said no one ever had enough evidence to bring a charge. Twice, sets of remains have been found that cause surviving family members to hope that they might at last have some of their questions answered. But no one has conclusively identified those remains. 43 years ago, a young woman left her home and her three children. Those children never saw her again. Sue Roop's disappearance left ripples in her wake that produced other deaths, other crimes. The void she left was filled with pain. Thanks to you for listening, and thanks to Tommy Siner for recording A Real Crime by Susan Williams.